don't know if you got, uh, I wasn't even sure if you would pick up today because I got this up. It's, it's like, how do, you, how do you want Blake to be introduced? And I, I had a party with it. I, and I, I hope you had a sense of humor. Oh. Um, Blake, I, I, I read it, uh, folks, folks, for those listening at home, first off, I'm Charles Dobbins the multifamily attorney and the founder of the Multifamily Investing Academy. You, Academy, you are on the Multifamily Podcast. I have my guest here, Blake Janover. And let me just give you a little inside baseball. So uh, when when Deb or uh, it's Trevor who signs up people, we send out a a, um, a questionnaire just to, just to, you know, because a lot of these times I get, you know, people I've never even met before that I'm interviewing. And so I need to find out a little bit about him beforehand. And so I get this, uh, I get Blake's uh, uh, biography. Blake, I'm going to read it out loud because I love it. I absolutely love it. First up, first up. Don't um, do it. Oh, Don't no, absolutely. No, this is gold. This is gold. You, <laughs> no, no, this, is, this needs to be read. And not only that, Blake, but I'm going to read it probably my best Wink Martindale uh, voice, okay? You know, just because you get that, you know, that, that point at the end. So, First up, he starts out, the question is that he has to answer. Here's the question that he has to answer. How would you like to be introduced at the beginning of the podcast? He puts in parentheses, this feels narcissistic, okay? And like right away when I read that, I'm like, oh, I like this guy. I like this guy. And then he goes on to give me two potential intros, okay? So here's the first one. You, folks at home, you decide which one you like better. Here we go. Meet Blake Janover, the tallest, smartest, most handsome, well-endowed Jew in Miami. My Maverick millionaire basketball, baseball, and golf star. He's been called the white Michael Jordan meets Tiger Woods meets Denzel Washington. Here's Blake. I love that. That was perfect. I can I get so much to work with on that material. So so perfect. And then it feels Blake. modest, but okay. <laughs> I love that. I love, I love the most well endowed Jew in Miami. Let me just tell you something. That's probably not saying very much, right? It's a short list. <laughs> okay. Blake Janover is the founder and CEO of Janover Ventures, a tech-enabled multifamily and commercial real estate finance company. He's originated and underwritten billions of dollars in loans over the last 15 plus years, is a member of the Forbes Real Estate Council and a contributor to publications like Forbes and Housing Wire. Uh, he says he may be, not be, but a lot of things. But when it comes to commercial real estate finance, he's been paving the way to democratize commercial real estate capital markets since before the last cycle. Before the last cycle. I'll tell you something, uh, Blake. I really think that's what distinguishes so many people in this business is to really be understand this business. Uh, you've got to have lived through a cycle. And I see a lot of guys out there right now that they haven't lived through a cycle. So they haven't, they don't know what, what, you know, is potentially going to happen uh, and what they, what they're in store for. So I hopefully, you know, today on, on the call, I want to delve into that with you. Uh, but welcome aboard, pal. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm i uh, I'm a fan and, and now I'm, uh, I'm a bit embarrassed, but. Uh... No, 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 no. Are you kidding me? Yeah, you know, no, it's all good. It's so good. I loved it. I love it. That was perfect. That was great. So, um, you know, and, and, and it, you know what? I, I feel like I know you now, uh, you know, even, even though, you know, this uh, is it, you know, I want to play golf with you. I'm no good. Oh, well, <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. Just get out of it. Get out of the office. Okay. So let's talk about your past. So you've already been through, you know, you're probably knocking on two circles probably approaching a third, which I definitely want to talk to you about. Uh, so give us, give me a background. Like, how'd you get started in this business? Where'd you come from? What was it? What was it? Uh, you know, Charles, your... real quick, we're having a lot of interference. I don't know if you're hearing it on your end, but I'm hearing it on mine. Okay. You're, you sound perfect on mine. Let me see if I, if I can, uh, how's that? Can you hear that? I hear you fine. Yeah. Let me, I'm going to close some things on my computer here. And um, there was some breakup during the, the second introduction also. I don't oh, know if that's going to reflect on the recording, um, but I, I did want to point it okay, out. Okay, okay. It may just show up on your end, and the okay. recording may be fine. Deb, is gonna, Deb listens to everything, the poor girl, and uh, she uh, gets to hear, uh, you know, she'll tell me if there's something wrong. We'll go back and fix it. So, um, All righty. So, all right. So my question is, give me your background. Enough of that. Enough of the uh, the highlights and resume highlights. Tell me, where'd you come from? How'd you end up in this business? Uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. 
Uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay. Uh, let, let's see if I can present some kind of abridged version of this. Um, no, no, we have no time limits. This is a podcast. <laughs> you know, Joe Rogan. Hero. Nope. I'm not. I'm not emotionally prepared for a Joe Rogan length event here. I I okay. could try. I'm just. I'm going to need bathroom break breaks. All right, yeah, that's true. I I hear this. I do too. All right, go ahead. Uh, okay. So um, this. Now I'm getting background buzzing. I don't know if you're hearing that too. No. Oh, no. no. Hold on. Is that your phone? It was my phone. It was my son. It was my son. He's a, uh, he's a, um, uh, uh, look, licking his wounds. Uh, he's a, he's a sophomore at George Mason university. Uh, so he was, he's uh, very active in the college Republicans. Okay. Listen, don't, 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 no, don't judge because I got another son that's, uh, you know, that's, that's to the, to the left of AOC. Okay. So I got them all. Uh, but he's looking his wounds right now as, as for his candidate got, got it handed to him last night in uh, <laughs> Virginia. So, so he's calling, a, calling to, a, to, to say, you know, what do I do now, dad? Like, right. Right. Do you have advice for that? Yeah, I do. If you live in, if you continue to live in Virginia, become a Democrat. If you're right. Like, yeah, yeah, that's what Great you advice. Right. Yeah. Hey, listen, Switch that's, teams. What Kennedys, that's what the Kennedys did. The Kennedys were the most Republican people, you know, we're back in the, in the 40s, 50s and 60s. And the only way they would win office is if they were a Democrat up here in Massachusetts. So that's what they did. If brand loyalty is limited. Trump and Bloomberg, they've all, you know, jumped back and forth. Uh, Exactly. And there's no difference between uh, either one of them. It's just who's got the bigger office, if, you know, because they're in power. So, all right, we so, can talk more about this later, but go, go ahead. T tell me, tell me your story. I, I started in, um, I got into residential uh, finance somewhere in the very early 2000s. Um, from my entry was actually from a, a digital marketing and uh, technology uh, standpoint where we were essentially um, we were generating um, leads and interest and contacts online. Um, and I, one day I went and I kind of sold one of these big lists to, to a mortgage company and they gave me a lot of money. And I said, Oh my God, this is so much money. Let me come work for you and figure out why you guys like paid so much for these things that I know you know, so little about because I, I was very green to the industry. Um, and I, uh, and I, I, I went, I took a job with them. I grew inside their company. There was contention. I think I grew too fast. The owners got intimidated. I broke off. I started my own, my own company, uh, out of, uh, out of my apartment. Um, I don't know how old I was. Maybe I was 18, 19. Um, oh, man. yeah. And, uh, I opened up the yellow pages because that's that was a thing back then a book like this <laughs> and i called every uh every bank and mortgage company in the yellow pages and i said hi my name is blake i'm i don't know how old i am i'm 18 years old i'm 17 years old whatever it was i'm gonna get my mortgage broker's license i'm gonna open a branch of your company out of my apartment which is uh barely furnished and uh you know, I'm going to make a million dollars the first year. Uh, and, uh, and then I'm going to make my own company and everybody kind of laughed at me and, and whatever else. And one guy said, you. what's that? I would have hired you. Well, one guy did. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, I, I made true on my part and, uh, and it was, you know, it was a journey, uh, you know, hired all my buddies. There's, you know, this is, this is, uh, you know, more than 15 years ago. So we have big CRT monitors, big computers, physical phones yeah. that are all like lining through the apartment. And, um, but and I also were at the time when, you know, that was before the last crash. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. That was, yeah. Yeah. That was, I was, I was riding the wave. So I was on, I, I was, I was arrogant. Uh, you know, I was a, I was a young man and I was successful, which, um, you know, fed the arrogance. Um, and, uh, and, and I didn't know what a cycle was. Uh, so I, I rode the wave and, um, I closed my first big commercial deal myself when, when I was probably 21 years old, it was like a, uh, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was like 25, 25, $30 million full capital stack deal with like senior Mez LP. Um, and, uh, you know, at that time I, I, as, 
as the business uh, grew, maybe we had like 30 uh, guys. We had a big office. We were doing a lot of volume. I was a direct lender. Um, and, uh, and then the world ended. Uh, this was this this is the a visual for like a tidal wave uh, going going against me going right over the cliff. Yeah, it's and me in my I just want to give you this one thing in my infinite wisdom, I took all my savings and all my money and everything I had and I pushed it back into the business because I said everybody's going to sink and I'm just going to outlive everybody. Exactly, which I did not. No, and let me ask you this: When did the crash happen for you? What was the event that you can look back on and you knew, wait a minute, my world is just changing? Yeah. Um, I don't remember the date, but I remember the event. I remember the moment. Uh, so we were, we were a residential and commercial lender um, and broker. Uh, and we had in our office a big board uh, with all of our loans on it that are in processing that are going to close. And uh, I remember th the day that I, that I started getting the phone calls that none of these loans are going to close. So we, we were going to close the loans and then, um, and then sell them, but we got the phone calls like, we're not buying your loans. Um, we're not, we're pulling our warehouse lines and it all happened the same day. And I was, I don't know how old I was, 20, 24, something like this. I wasn't as confused as I should have been. I was like, ah, you know, this is just a blip, but, but, but I understood, you know, deeply, uh, this was, this was more than a blip. You know, I gotta tell you, you could, I wouldn't sell yourself short on and just being young, but it happened for me. I was like, Oh, okay, we'll just pivot. And, no one knew how bad it was. Some know. people did. Some people oh, did. You had to be really, I mean, yeah, if you watch The Big Short, which is one of my most favorite movies, that and Gone with the Wind, um, you know, that it, when you see those guys, those really smart guys that just think outside the box and they say there's something wrong here, they knew. They knew. But, I mean, even the, the people, you know, with all the, all the you know, big uh, investment firms, they never knew. Uh, I mean, I remember my my event was when we had we were approved w with KeyBank for the deal, uh, and, and it was a Fannie 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 deal. Uh, and thirty days, you, you know, we're going to close in thirty days. Our money was hard. We're all set to go, and then all of a sudden, um, the uh, you know the deal uh, they call up and say we're pulling out. We're getting out of the multifamily business altogether. I'm like, wow, you know there must be something wrong with key bank that they're, that they are just getting jumping out of the business. And then you started to see it happen all over. We, we closed that deal 30 days later, but Good for you. That, it, we should have seen the handwriting on the wall and walked away ourselves. That's what we should have done. So, but we didn't, we didn't. Uh, Hindsight's 2020. No, I know. But let uh, me ask you something. While I, yeah. I mean, this is one of my most favorite topics is what do you think is going on right now? <laughs> you know, I mean, so, so, so where, and in, in what capacity, okay, because well, strictly multifamily, uh, strictly multifamily, because that's all I, I deal with is, is multifamily. So, I mean, I ask this question of everybody and I'm, I'm, I love the answers I get. They're all over the board. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, who is the one that's coming up with a, with a better mousetrap for the answer. Uh, so what do you think, Blake? I'll tell you what I hear, and you tell me what what you th what you think. Um, oh, okay, you want me to you want me to go first? Yep, yep, okay. Yep. I'm going to hold my cards in first, and then I'll I'll uh, I'll tell you if you're right or wrong. How's that? <laughs> I'm almost definitely wrong, Charles. <laughs> well, listen, um, my answer will be wrong too, because it has for the last two cycles. Okay. That's right. I I uh, I can commiserate with you uh, there. So. Multifamily. Where are we in multifamily from from a market perspective? I think I think the first. I don't think I'm going to tell you anything that you haven't heard or that or that you don't know. And if I and, and if it is something you haven't heard or you don't know, then it's probably it's probably out in left field, um, and, and I'm probably way off. So, uh, multifamily uh, is a product, and to speak of the multifamily market, I think requires a uh, overlaying. Uh, Submarkets. Um, 
I think, I think within multifamily, um, it's there, there's two, there's two giant sensitivities. The first one is submarket, right? Um, because submarkets experience, um, from an economics perspective, uh, supply and demand, uh, like any other widget we're, we're trying to measure. So, uh, in a market like, um, downtown Miami or Brickle, for example, um, there's an enormous amount of supply and there may not be enough, uh, enough demand, which, which will have, uh, impact on, on performance. And we can talk about what that impact looks like because, uh, impacting one metric or one KPI, like, uh, like rents, uh, like GPR uh, 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 is is one thing, but when you start when you start touching multiple KPIs like uh, um, you know GPR and vacancy and cap rates, uh, you, you this you start to experience some kind of compounding uh, negative effect. But any, anyway, I digress. So uh, so a Class A product in downtown Miami or, or, or Brickell, um, th- this is uh, a very uh, this is a, a frothy place. Uh, but if you go outside of Miami uh, and you shoot over to, let's say, Coconut Grove or uh, where a Class A product may, may perform very well or to Hialeah where uh, like a new B-plus product um, is in desperate need, uh, these places are all very close. So, so, so I think the first overlay is, um, is, is sub-market. Uh, the second overlay is, is asset class. Uh, you're, you're going to find a uh, totally different performance in, 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 in each submarket, uh, depending on our, if you're a class A institutional grade, super luxury product, this is, this is a different product than a uh, C plus um, garden style uh, deal in the same, in the same submarket. So to make any generalizations is, um, irresponsible uh deep analysis of 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 these related factors uh i think is i think is required now i'll make a prediction okay and i'll tell you if your prediction is right (laughs) here's here's the prediction my prediction is in um certain markets uh in face of a recession uh overlaid with uh, with big supply pipelines of class A products. Uh, I think you will see suffering in some of these, in some of these markets suffering uh, from, from the, the, the property owners. And I think you'll see gains in secondary and tertiary markets with real economic drivers with job creation and population growth. And I, I it just, I, I, I do believe that in the age of knowledge workers and uh, decentralization of offices, uh, especially if there is a recession on the horizon, I think, I think these factors could lead to um, moving away from uh, uh, Class A ultra luxury products that are you know that are getting smaller and smaller and smaller in uh, urban infill markets and you and I think you may see some uh, exodus to uh, more comfortable affordable uh, submarkets. I, this was a long winded response, but well, well, let me let me let me give you my my overlay on top of it. First off, your analysis sounds like it comes from a guy that's lived through a cycle before. So you're looking at this, uh, you know, but then I want to, I totally agree with your analysis and the conclusion. And the thing that you, that you used to come to that conclusion is what we all have to focus on supply and demand. That's all it is. It's your typical business. You have to look at the supply and the demand right now. They're in certain markets. Like you said, I'm shocked at the amount of supply that just continues to keep coming into the market. And the only way that we are going to survive, and this is the biggest question mark, is if the demand for that supply remains strong. How are you going to have more and more, you know, one and two bedroom apartments for $2,500, $3,000 get get swallowed up 
sooner or later, you're going to run out of customers that can afford that. And when does that happen? And that's going to happen, like you said, in those class A markets. That's where it's, it's, it's going to it's going to start to come back down. Uh, but I totally agree with what you're saying on the on the tertiary, the secondary, and the tertiary markets with a B class pro, uh, product. Those are are the numbers on those. What they're selling for is uh, is unbelievable. And we're having the hardest time making the numbers work on some of those types of, of products because they're much in demand. Because I think I agree with you. I, I think people are going to start seeing that as the next big boom uh, you know, when the market starts to turn. Let's go back uh, in, in your discussion, your, in your analysis, and let's see what you think about this. Where are those customers coming from? You talk about, about the, the decentralization of offices. Absolutely. I can work anywhere in the world. You have no idea where I am. I have no idea where you are. And, and yet I can reach out and be in touch with my, any of my clients in seconds. And that is where the world is moving. So the decentralization of offices allows us to be anywhere we want. We don't need to be in downtown Boston, the Seaport District. You keep talking about uh, Brick, Brickell, is it? Or, uh, Brickell, yeah. It's, it's a district in downtown Miami. Right. It sounds like it's the booming area. It sounds like it's the Seaport District here in Boston. And right. That's where that's where you know uh, all the uh, everybody wants to live down there because it is happening. It is the, the cool spot to be. But sooner or later, that's you know those, every time you drive down there, the, the amount of new construction is just uh, unbelievable. But the big question is, and and how, tell me what you think about this. One aspect about this market that is so unique to the last cycle is. The, our new customers coming into the marketplace have never been more saddled with debt, battled with debt, student loan debt than they ever have before. And I seriously think that this is a, a, having a huge impact on home ownership, which then drives the apartment uh, market very, very strongly. And I think that is actually helping us go through it. What do you think? Well, okay. Yeah. So much of my opinion here. Uh, this, this podcast may not be worth much in the end, but oh, no, 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 this is fun. I love this discussion. Before we, no, see. I do too. I do too. I don't get, I don't have it as enough. I, 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 I got to talk to you about Fannie Mae. I got a couple of questions for you about Fannie Mae uh, deals uh, sure. before we get off, but, but let's, let's, let's catch up on it. And I, so before, I, go ahead. I'm sorry. The last part. Where we will get to your business. You, you know I mean, yeah. like I want people to get to know you and uh, know how to know how to get a hold of you so but but this is cool i love this stuff i love this stuff too so let's let's keep geeking out here before and by the way i'm, I'm looking down i just i use a notepad and a pencil in order to uh you know, have to take notes so before i before i go to the the what you commented about what's unique and and the debt um situation which which, which i agree with um i just wanted to to circle back and 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 speak to something that you spoke you spoke of, which is that in the vein of supply and demand, we have to uh, f find these tenants that are uh, going to pay these enormous uh, Class A rents. Yep. And um, one of the ways, uh, and so so one of the challenges or or or, or issues is all of these pro formas that trend rents on class A apartments and they say rents are going to keep going up at 3% per year because that's inflation except for the caveat uh, that <laughs> there has to be um, a, a direct correlation uh, between household income and these rent increases with or without uh, this inflation adjustment. And I, I've seen so many pro formas where rents are trended up, expenses are static, and there's a pro forma for a, um, for a, a, a lower cap rate. And to speak to markets outside of these big Boston, San, Di San Francisco, LA, whatever, I feel like the invention of Austin, Texas is relevant. Uh, as major employers moved out of these supermarkets, uh, not, not supermarket like where you go shopping, but like yeah. supermarkets like 
San Francisco and, and, and Seattle and came to a more affordable place with, with, with uh, a great education system um, and, and, and a great opportunity to hire people. Uh, it, it, I, I, I think- Right to work states, you know, that's, that's a factor as well. For sure. And there, I mean, there's a lot of factors, right? There's tax factors, there's all kinds of factors. But I think, I just, I think that's like a really clear representation of this, um, of this move uh, to, uh, to smaller markets. Um, as far as, as far as unique factors in this, in this environment, since you've already mentioned some valuable ones, I'll mention some different ones. Okay. It's perilous, but this is like the age of the merchant builder, um, the non-recourse high leverage construction loan coming in, uh, you know, uh, coming in and building a uh, class A product in, in, in already uh, uh, what we'll call frothy mark markets. But oh, what did you just call it? The what builder? The merchant builder. Merchant builder. Yeah. One, one whom uh, builds to flip. Uh, one who builds to recap and flip. So I think, I think with, I would hypothesize that something that's, that's aided the growth of this, of class A, because I think that class A is, is where we're seeing a lot of the new um, millennial tenant uh, that, that can afford it, at least depending on the market. Um, with low cap rates, these, super low cap rates, the, the value per door, per unit, per foot is, has climbed uh, so much higher than uh, condo, residential condo prices. And it's given, and, 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 it, and this is a much lower friction environment for a, a merchant builder or a developer to, to operate in. Um, because you don't have to sell tons of units and there's no, the sales and the marketing uh, is much more com uh, a complex with condo. It's, a, it's an easier deal to build rental, rent up, recap, uh, or, or sell, uh, re recap through a sale or refinance. So they've had the opportunity to really um, create these super uh, amenitized projects that never existed before. Uh, we see amenities that are unbelievable. Your cat is going to get a massage and we're going to valet your car. We've got pools and saunas. And... Well, exactly. Yeah. And, and I think, I think with, with this luxury system, and by the way, uh, millennials are becoming more and more, I don't want to say just millennials, uh, humans are becoming more and more uh, uh, adaptable to having smaller apartments, which means that developers can even go even heavier uh, on amenities and cap higher price. So, so, so like, like you've yeah. ever gone to Ikea? Yeah. You see those, those, you know, like, you know, what a 350 square foot apartment could look like, you know, with just, uh, I want to live. Go to Japan. To Japan, <laughs> they're living in shoe boxes. And they've got, and they and, and with like three bedrooms. I don't know how you get three bedrooms in a shoebox. I get a 3,700 square foot house and I walk into that IKEA 350 square foot apartment. I'm like, it's crazy. This is luxury for me. This would be luxury, you know, compared to my big, beautiful house. Gosh, it's crazy. It's right. But that's an interesting point. And I like what you said that as these cap rates come down, which obviously increases the value of the property, which obviously increases the value of the price per unit that you're buying compared to the condo. The, 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 the growth of, of the value of those two living units, the apartments have taken off so much more than a, you know, a condo. And that's going to have an impact. Yeah, I mean, look at the opportunity cost. You can, you can take a bunch of savings that you may or may not have yeah. and get a mortgage, but everybody now knows, even in the back of their heads, that owning a house isn't, or owning a home, it may not be the American dream anymore, right? Because it used to be that this was the number one source of wealth building. Um, but in all, and I actually have chills even thinking about it, but in all of our recent memory, uh, this was also the number one source of wealth destruction uh, 
on on Earth for for some period of time. So so now you it, buying a house has you know it could go up, it may go up, but it could also go down. Um, and and now you've got to overlay right like all right I'm going to put a bunch of money out of pocket. It's not a guaranteed investment. My monthly payments are still going to be high. I'm responsible for everything. I've got insurance, taxes, maintenance, or um, I'm going to get ushered around in, uh, you know, in like a horse and carriage in my new uh, Zom uh, apartment community that's got 17 pools and uh, movie theaters and, and, and this, that. Um, maybe, maybe my money's better in the market. Uh, maybe my, my money's better in cash because I'm, you know, because I'm, I'm nervous. But uh, I think these are, I think these are interesting things that probably warrant uh, some, uh, you know, exploration and studies that, that I certainly haven't done. I think a lot of this is anecdotally uh, derived. No, but I tell you, I, you open my eyes now because you kind of keep looking at the customer who buys the soap. They always have to ask that question. And, and you're absolutely right that the, that that customer has now got different options than, it, than his parents ever did. Um, you know, by living in an apartment back when my parents were, were you know, getting started, that was, that was second class. That was second class. Now, I mean, my sister and her cardiologist husband uh, live in a two-bedroom apartment down the Seaport District of, of Boston, and they will never own a house again. They don't. That maybe the lawyer down in Nantucket, but they're not going to own it. You know, that doesn't need to be their primary residence. They want the freedom to be able to go wherever they want, not have to worry about these things. And that's how people are thinking nowadays. Yeah, and and there's and there's this opportunity cost analysis that that this mental model for what are the alternatives that I could do with the money that 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 didn't exist before. So, so you 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 essentially have this opportunity to live a more flexible, potentially more comfortable, lower cost, lower risk, risk lifestyle. Um, this is a, this is a compelling offer. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I love it. That's, I, you've got me thinking that's going to, that's a scary place. Scary thing for me there, Blake, but uh, all right, listen, let's get, let's get to the business at hand. Let's talk, uh, you, you know, you, you now get out of the, the overnight, you are, uh, you know, uh, can you believe we're going back to the original conversation? That's why I love that these podcasts are so unscripted. But let's, okay, thank you so much for this analysis. This is what I was looking for. I can talk this talk all day long. We and, can do it. Oh, I love multifamily. I think it's just so fascinating. I think the economics of multifamily is fascinating. I love how the numbers all tie and work together like a beautiful ballet. And multifamily just makes total sense to me. And to, to hear you know, but what other people think the trends are and where, where this market is going, it just, you know, I, 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 do, I don't, I do not disagree with anything you've said. I think you've, you've added to my, uh, my timber here. So it's, uh, it's cool. It's awesome. All right. Enough of that. Enough of you. Enough of you. Yeah. Well, let's talk about you. Um, <laughs> yeah. So You're okay, fun. what did you do? What did you do? I know what I did. What did you do? What happened? Uh, the first thing I did was I thought the right thing to do was to just work harder and you know just keep plowing the money back in when you should have taken the money off the off the table and gone on vacation to Miami Beach. Right. So um, needless to say, I, I didn't do that. So I put the money back in um, to the last dollar. Uh, the residential business went out. I uh, but I stayed in commercial for for a, a, a while longer. Um, and closed a couple more, you know, uh, big deals that were um, non-institutional debt fund type money, uh, and then and then uh, it was uh, hiding my cars from the repo man and convincing uh, the FPNL, the Florida Power and Light guy, not to turn off my electricity. Um, so uh, so I was uh, going through this. Um, and you know, I never, I never left commercial or multifamily. I was always in touch and connected with the folks there, but during this credit freeze, uh, we had limited, I had limited options. So, uh, there was a period of time where, uh, I had pivoted hard. Um, 
out of the business. So even though my finger was on the pulse and my connections were all there and everything else, I had to generate cash flow. Um, so I got into, uh, I started a company um, out of my apartment again, which was, uh, it was something to the tune of consumer debt management services, helping people um, get out of their, uh, get out of the, the terrible debt they were in with banks, like chasing everybody down uh, to pay off uh, their enormous credit card balances with enormous fees and everything else. Um, <laughs> we built quite a business there. Um, I ended up, and uh, this will be too far off subject to go into, but I ended up in the Dominican Republic for um, many years and had uh, at one point when I was maybe 26 years old, we had several hundred employees in the capital, uh, of, uh, which was Santa Domingo. Um, and we were doing, uh, uh, consumer financial services. Uh, and, and, and at the same time, I, uh, opened a, uh, a nutraceuticals company, vitamin and supplement company, which I later sold. Um, and, uh, I had, uh, I, I, I advised on and built uh, the first uh, real digital marketing and social media marketing campaign for a presidential candidate in that country. And now these things are, 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 are prevalent. I uh, even, uh, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I led the charge on these things out there. Um, and, uh, and I also took a, uh, I also took at the, at the tail end of some of these things. And there was good and bad, by the way, it's like, it's like a cool story, but I filed bankruptcy when I was like 25 years old. I, uh, for, for more than like a million dollars, it was a mess. Um, Listen, we all lived through it. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's, if you haven't been through it, I mean, I just, let me tell you something. I invested in this bank. All right. The guy that I invested with had started another bank beforehand and that failed. Yeah. And, Yes. If somebody said, why would you invest in this bank? You know, uh, uh, lost one bank. I said, because now's the time to invest with them. I only want to work with people that have failed. You know, show me yeah, something very smart more than you can ever imagine. And, and, you know, they're not going to make, they, they learn those mistakes. They're not going to make it. I'll tell you something. The stuff that I see these, these gurus who have never been through a cycle out there saying scares the daylights out of me. I wouldn't, yeah. I, you know, knowing what I know, I wouldn't touch these guys with a 10 foot. There's a lot of buy high, sell higher out there. Oh. This is going to go up forever, you know, and Gosh. yeah. Okay. 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 Everybody hears me say this and they, and they know, I'm going to see if you know who I'm talking about. Um, but I hear this one guru is out there saying you can, you can always overpay for multifamily property because the price is just going to go up. No, if I saw him say that, I'd, I, you'd see my, you'd see me post on social media, um, something very uh, critical of that. And, and I try to reach his LPs so that people know that this is. Listen, I, I'd say that this guy is probably about 14 years old because he obviously didn't live through the last crash because I own property that never came back in value. Let me tell you something. I know people that lived through the last crash and they, and, and, and they are, they have short memories. They have short memories, man. Man, I remember those sleepless nights. And I, that's what I teach my clients. I don't want them to go through that, that way. way to build a business the right way and survive those types of cycles and you'll still have a nice so strong solid business or you can just go back to the way we did it before and you'll get you'll get trapped and i, I just uh, I, I i i'm not doing that i'm not never doing that again life is too never short again oh so, yes is. again so you know and I, it's like you know you first thing you do is you pay yourself first and you know a lot of these guys don't even don't even realize, oh, i'll make it up later i'll make it up later you know, you, you lose money every deal you do, but you make it up on volume. I mean, that's, uh, you, you still see a lot of that going on. It's crazy. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's one. I, so I could not agree with you more. I see those guys out there, uh, you know, saying this and it scares the daylights out of me. It scares the daylights out of me. So. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's irresponsible. Maybe after the show, you can tell me who it is and I can, um, uh, I can call them out because <laughs> I will. No, you know, and I will do that. I will, I will email you the name. Um, people on the call, a lot of people on the call, 
I know who I'm talking about, but I, I won't I won't say it. But I'll tell you something. You know, I've been in trouble with the SEC before. They are idiots, first off, and they don't uh, really care, you know, about your who you are, what what uh, what you've done. Um, but they will as soon as the market turns next time, as soon as this market turns, they're going to go after that guy because of that comment. That comment you would never put into a private placement memorandum and say, here are the risk factors. No, they're really- it, it was it wasn't in a PPM, was it? No. I'm okay, <laughs> that would be crazy. Because his lawyer is a good friend of mine, and yeah. he would never do that uh, to a client. This lawyer knows exactly yeah. what to do. But uh, but I can tell you, uh, this guy is uh, he's he's cruising for a bruising. So yeah, yeah, sure. Mess with those guys. So all right, so let's get, let's get get up here to uh, fit. so now you're doing commercial. And have you found your home, Blake? Are you home now? You yes. Know? Okay, you, you know, you're yeah. a good, stable uh, market, especially. It's a good business to be in. Um, no, so let me ask you, so do you work as a, uh, as a broker for the commercial deals? You've got a whole bunch of different uh, sources to go to. How, how, how does it, what, one of my students work with a guy like you? So we're, we're a financial intermediary, commercial mortgage broker, whatever you want to call it. Uh, our focus is, uh, is multifamily. Um, and, uh, our preferred, uh, the preferred venues in which we work would be Fannie, Freddie, FHA and, and CMBS. Now there, there's, there's some confusion, I think, around, uh, around these products that I want to clear up. Um, some we've, we've encountered this before, but some folks are like, oh, I've got a relationship with, um, Arbor and, and uh, they're going to do, they're going to do my loan and God bless Arbor. I, I, I do a lot of business with them. They're wonderful guys. Uh, depends on who you work with. Right. I, I think it goes for all shops, right? First off, don't classify a company uh, by the human. You, you want to work with the right human and then the company will look good. Uh, generally speaking, if you're, as long as you're choosing from a top shop. So, um, so anyway, you go to, you go to Arbor and you've got a, an affordable, uh, you got an affordable property and Arbor's got a great uh, Fannie small loan. It's in a, it's in a secondary market and, and they put you in a Fannie deal because, because that's what they've got. But Sabal has a Freddie uh, target affordable product uh, that, that Arbor doesn't have. Um, and the first misconception is that Fannie is a product and Freddie is a product and FHA is a product. It's totally, uh, this is, this is uh, misleading. Fannie has dozens of products in its portfolio. Freddie has dozens of products. There are dozens of iterations of, of, of an FHA insured loan. And uh, if you go to a lender, um, and not all lenders have the same products, they, you may have 10 lenders that have Fannie loans, but they don't all have the same Fannie loans. Uh, in the same types. So, so the first thing that you're going to run into is you're going to run into a lender that's going to put you into one of their, one of their products that they have. This can make a difference um, between five and 10% uh, of leverage, which could be a double digit change to your cash on cash returns for yourself, for your LPs. Uh, this could mean a 20, 30 basis point difference on the interest rate. This could be the difference between no interest only and a few years of IO, uh, which has an enormous effect on your cash on cash returns as an investor, which, 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 is, which is an important thing uh, to talk about. Um, so, so the first thing is Fannie, Freddie, FHA, they all have different products. Now, another thing is, is that lenders determine um, and I'm not really answering your question, but I'm going to get there. Um, no, no, you're doing fine because I want to go back to the Saval uh, point. Sure. Um, do you want? Do you want me to keep going, or do you want to pause and talk about that? Yeah, I want to make this point. I want to ask you about that. So, different lenders have different requirements. So, DUS is the is the delegated platform under Fannie, where right. lenders can make decisions. So. I think a good example is there's one lender that I know, I don't want to put their name out there, that used to do um, Fannie small balance loans um, down to $750,000. And we talked to people and they'd say, no, no lender does under a million. Well, this lender did. Now that same lender won't go under 3 million. There is, but you could still get a Fannie small loan from another lender um, 
for, for a million or 750,000. So there's an enormous amount of prerogative that exists um, amongst the lenders. Uh, and, and this is another important consideration. Another example that would be FHA. If you go to lender one, they may not do an FHA or a HUD 221D4 construction loan for under $10 million. No, there's no HUD under 10 million. But you may go to another lender who's willing to do one for 700 grand. And, and, and we have one of those. So, so these, are, these are like a few basic examples. And the, last, and the last thing is a lender, if you're working with a good financial intermediary, besides the fact that they're gonna put you in the right product with the right lender and, and give you transparency, it shouldn't cost you more as a borrower. It should cost you the same or less. It'll cost you less in the long run because you're working with somebody that's reputable and they're gonna put you in the right product. But it should, it should cost you less because high volume financial intermediaries like us, like Janowar Ventures or like uh, perhaps Meridian Capital or, uh, or, or another big shop, um, we're doing a lot of volume and the lender has to reduce what they make on the deal and, and, and share their backend earnings with us so that we can either pass savings on to you or certainly not charge you anything. We don't charge a fee for Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA. We don't charge a fee. Um, and, and, and your, your broker shouldn't either. Uh, right. You're talking about, I mean, they make their money on the success factor. The lender, right. The lender makes their money. The lender may charge a fee. The lender may not charge a fee. It depends on the deal. The lender may, 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 may make their money when they sell it in the secondary market. They may make it off of, uh, uh, uh off of servicing, but, but we're not going to charge you a mortgage broker fee for a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac and FHA loan. No, we do a lot of volume with all of the lenders that we work with and they're just, they're just going to chop their earnings in half. And, uh, and, and, and we're going to try to get you the best deals so we can do more deals because we want to do volume. Yeah. Okay. So, so let me see if I understand this correctly. I think there are about 26, 28 different dust lenders you know, maybe, uh, uh, around the country. What you're saying is that, okay, you know, they can be all Fannie, uh, Fannie or Freddie lenders. But each one of them has the ability to custom design their own product or whatever market they want to go after. To a and degree. Fannie just kind of comes in there and, and, uh, and ensures their, their product, so to speak. Well, ensures, no, but, but, but to a degree, right? Yeah, so, so they're going so to create like, the secondary. Like I say that because my background is in insurance. So you know, yes. I, look at, I look at Fannie as kind of coming in there uh, to an agency an insurance agency saying, Hey, we're going to back you with this product, you know, uh, go out there and, and go out and sell it. Uh, you know, but they're not going to give it to somebody, some other agency down the street. So that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Yeah. So that's right, Charles. And, and there's more to it, right? So, so there may be 26 dust lenders out there, uh, for example, I, I forget what the real number is, well, but I mean, there may be only five or 10 any small lenders that are out there. And there may be only three or four of them that aren't in pre-review, that aren't getting a little prostate exam from Fannie on every single deal that they do. And a, a lender that's been working with Fannie Small, for example, for loans between one and seven and a half million dollars for 10 years, if they have a change of leadership in underwriting, like a chief credit officer uh, or, or, or a deputy chief underwriter, they're going to drop back into pre-review. And, um, and these pre-review things are things that can uh, really slow down a deal, reduce what a lender can do. You will find one deal that one lender can't do, one lender can do with a certain set of terms, and another lender can do with another set of terms, and it can all be Fannie. Oh, I, you know what? That's, that's interesting. Two things you said uh, are novel to me. Um, first off, that last part about, you know, kind of like figuring out, is, this kind of goes back to that, that right when Fannie crashed. Uh, I had a, I had my product approved with Key Key Bank, and then they put out we put it with Walker Dunlop after after that. So there's a perfect example of how one Fannie lender would do it, and another Fannie lender uh, wouldn't do it, uh, which is kind of different than what you hear from many mortgage brokers who say, "No, you don't need to shop it around to all the whole bunch of different brokers because everything ends up at Fannie anyway." But now you're saying the Fannie, not all Fannie is the same. Yeah. Anything? The other thing sorry. is the pre-review component. Now, you just the way you just described it is different uh, than the terminology I'm, I'm typically used to. When I say pre-review, I'm talking about a geographical area 
that Fannie has has cordoned off and said, not so fast in this area. We need to do we need uh, more uh, more skin in the game. You're saying, in addition to that, probably that there's other type of, of pre review scenarios such that maybe it's a brand new dust lender and or or they got uh, the dust lenders done a lousy job with their underwriting and their 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 you know loss ratio is huge and so Fannie Mae has put that dust lender on a pre review basis and that's going to impact. It. That's right. And I forget, um, I, I, I may have botched it up. I forget if it's peer review or pre-review. Well, I feel like it should be peer, but I don't remember. Uh, I've always known it as pre-review. No, pre-review is definitely the market. I'm just trying to think if there's a different terminology for when they're reviewing a lender. Okay. It might be pre or peer, I whatever. You. I'll Google it later. <laughs> don't, don't show up to my uh, podcast without knowing all the answers, okay? <laughs> right? My, my, yeah, all right. So, so anyway, so I guess um, if, you've got a, if you've got a loan over a million, you're, you can consider um, a handful of different um, Fannie and Freddie products, um, as well as FHA, um, which people know very little about, right? But you can get a 223F market rate FHA loan, 35 years fixed and fully amortizing at 85% LTV non-recourse. Um, and, uh, you know, including, uh, mortgage insurance, maybe to, based on today's rates pay under, I don't know, 3.6% or something like that. Um, so there, so there's a lot of this stuff out there. I mean, and, what everybody says about FHA is it's such a, it's got such a long, uh, you know, lead up, you know, a long, uh, underwriting period, uh, that they tend not to go with FHA. What pro what, um, type of property would you put in that deal? Why, why isn't everybody buying that deal? Um, it's, it's, it's tough to do on the acquisition side because you need time, 150 days. It's excellent for a recap, um, for, for, for refinancing an existing property. It's excellent for ground up construction. If you can buy the time, you, could, you can either take down a property with bridge uh, or if you can buy the time with the seller, you can you can buy a property with 223F. Most of the 223Fs we do are refinances of market rate um, property, uh, yeah. garden style type property. Uh, and uh, and it fits very well for that. And if it's for a purchase too, it's just, uh, it, it's time consuming, but, but it's not as painful as it used to be if you're working with the right lender. So a 223F, about 150 days. Um, a 221D4, which is construction, which I don't think your guys are doing, that can be, that could be seven to 10 months. It could be more, but, uh, but this is kind of congruent well, with 3,000. Uh, 224D, is that the, is that the rehab loan? 221D4 is for the substantial rehabilitation or ground up construction of a multifamily property. Okay. All right. Yeah. 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 So, so the, the point is there's a lot of products out there and then uh, I'm just going to throw this on top for loans over 2 million you can start to navigate the net worth and liquidity and experience requirements with some small CMBS lenders. And there's trade-offs, they're more expensive to originate, but rates are pretty tight. There's defeasance versus yield maintenance. Uh, there's, there's a series of things, but uh, I think a lot of people get killed um, for cumulative net worth and liquidity. And those things can really be navigated uh, better on the CMBS side and depending on the letter, uh, the lender on the FHA side as well. All right. Let me ask you this. Is there any type of, of uh, product you just wouldn't put your client with? I'm going to, that's such a loaded question or open-ended. Debt product? Yeah. Like what, what do you, what would you just not, not recommend? If like, you can, if you can get it. So, I mean, so first off, like, you know, Shady hard money lenders, uh, you know, 15% interest rates, uh, super high leverage mezzanine and preferred equity debt that's, that's debt based and, and, and pay current based. Anything with a personal guarantee. Um, uh, and, and listen, that, that is obviously spoken by somebody that's lived through the last cycle as well, because I, I had, uh, you know, I signed personally for a couple of mortgages and boy, you know, it cost me a lot of money to get out of them. Uh, you know, but fortunately I kept my house, you know, but they, for you. I didn't. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you, yeah, that's leverage, 
Le- leverage, leverage, is, leverage is great and debt is great until it's not. And personal guarantees don't mean anything until they do. Uh, yeah, you sound like you went to law school because I remember my, my property professor, <laughs> my, my property professor would always say, it's never a problem until it's a problem. And you know what? I, right. you know, I thought that was the stupidest thing to say until I became a lawyer. Then you realize, hey, you know what? It's never a problem until it becomes a problem. Then it's a problem. That's right. That's right. Absolutely right. So, 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 I, so, 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 so what would I steer away from personal guarantees at any and all at cost, unless, unless there's no alternative and it's a must. Okay. Let me ask you this one. How about uh, the, the uh, level, level of leverage? I'm so glad you asked. That's the direction I was going to go. Okay. Just because you can get 80% LTV and bolster your, your LPs returns and yours does not mean that you should do it. Uh, look, I'm, I'm, I'm acting like one of those people in one of those. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, welcome to church, Charles. <laughs> it's a Jewish church, but welcome. Share your heart, brother. Share your heart. <laughs> you know, with a Jew. I'm talking, I'm talking like a Christian. <laughs> share your heart, brother. Share your heart. Oh, my I'm God. I'm with you, Charles. So, um, let's, it's, let's, it, let, debt kills. I mean, mortgage is French for death grip. Uh, you know, there's a reason why it's that way. All businesses require cash. Uh, when you're out of cash, you're out of business. And if you have so much debt burdening the, your business, you better have a pretty solid business. But not everybody does. Don't burden your business. Go with the lower LTVs. It's up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you an, uh, an excerpt from an email I sent to a client today. Maybe I'll share this with her when you post it. Um, I'm, I'm just pulling up the email right now. Uh Give me just one second. This is when we go to go to uh, commercial break. Hey, it, are we going to a commercial break? Okay, okay, yeah, you know you do. Sign up for the owner forum of Medley Family Investing Academy. Actually, um, you know, I, I uh, you know, this might be kind of a, a, a you know lead, and uh, you know, we're doing a multifamily money conference. Um, Blake, I should have you on as a special guest. This is going to be in in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, in September of next year, we're putting it all together. And Blake, I'll, I'll tap you on the shoulder. I'll get you on there. And, uh, you know, especially when it comes to talking about the, what's going on in the marketplace. Um, I'll be there. A lot of fun. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. If, you, if you'd if you have me, I'd love to be there. Yeah, yeah, no, that would be great. That would be great. Uh, we just, uh, you know, it's going to be with uh, um, uh, my, my dear friend uh, in uh, SEC attorney, Jillian Sidoti, uh, and uh, a couple other uh, big name sponsors, Gene, uh, Gene Trowbridge. All coming together. It's going to be a multifamily money conference, and it's um, it's really going to be uh, two and a half days of, of, of education about debt equity, um, how to structure deals, uh, what's going on in the marketplace, all that type of stuff. So it's going to be really cool. It's going to be a lot of fun. I, thought, I would and, love to do that. And Blake, it's in Las Vegas, which people tell me is fun. I've never had fun in Las Vegas. Maybe this will be the first time. Who knows? Las, Las Vegas is no good for me. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm going to go, but uh, I don't know what the attraction. But, is. I don't know what the attraction. Is. People say, "Have you been to Paris?" Well, no, but I've been to the Eiffel Tower because I've been to. <laughs> That's right. Well, I I didn't I didn't find the email, but but I but I can tell you the the exact theme that I sent her, and I said, I said, it's really important. Oh, because she was talking to her bank about a deal, and. And the bank was giving her more leverage and probably with a shorter term and a shorter amortization. And I said, I'm going to tell you essentially what I would tell somebody in my family. Um, Don't sign recourse. Uh, The longer term mitigates future interest rate risk. The longer amortization will help with cash flow. Don't lever all the way up just because you can, because something to the tune of um, when surprises happen and they invariably do nobody got hurt with a little extra cash flow yeah okay let's talk about uh, everything you just talked and i'm gonna have to close it out but uh, you touched upon some great stuff and and this is the way i speak to my students i I said this is what i tell my grandmother never sign personally just don't do it it's not worth it if the only way you can make the deal happen is to sign personally walk away from the deal that no deal is that great that you're going to put your family and, and everything else at risk for that one deal. Let me add something to that real quick yeah. Be- because, because I'm ADD, I can't help myself. <laughs> just, 
out pretty well in this podcast for the two Asian people. So <laughs> we'll try it again. I'm sure. I'm sure. Like when we when we establish a large enough statistical set of these things, you'll we'll yes. we'll, we'll blow this up. Um, just because your loan. Now, this doesn't really apply to Fannie or Freddie or FHA, but it does to CMBS and it does to banks. Just because the loan that you're getting is non-recourse with carve-outs does not mean it's actually non-recourse. Oh, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a partial non-recourse. Non-recourse is a misnomer in, in those cases. You know, it's okay to sign bad boy carve outs, but here's where CMBS lenders and other lenders will trick and they'll have carve outs that are either ridiculous. Like if you don't submit your financial statements, your annual financial statements within 30 days of your fiscal year end, then, then you're in default, right? So that's not a non-recourse loan with standard carve outs. Yeah. Uh, that's a loan that really easily triggers recourse and they'll have other things, right? Like if like you'll originate the loan at a 1.3 debt service coverage ratio and they'll see if at any point in time you, you go below a 1.29 debt service coverage ratio, the loan's full recourse. That's not a non-recourse loan. That's a carve out that has to get negotiated out of, of, uh, of the carve outs. Okay. So that, that type of thing happens at, at the dust level at the de uh, delegated underwriter and servicer level. Cause that's not typical of Fannie, right? No, no. So Fannie, Freddy, FHA, these are safe, non-recourse standard carve-out loans. Okay. You start to see the shenanigans when there's a lot more autonomy, like okay. in CMBS and bank debt. Gotcha. Okay, that's that is that's fantastic information. Uh, so you know, when you start moving down the pipeline of potential, they can start putting those things in, and obviously they're negotiable, right? Right. Okay. So, right. Oh, oh my gosh, listen. That one piece right there is uh, so far in the whole, I mean, it's been a phenom phenomenal time with you here. <laughs> I love that because I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay. So, so never sign personally. Um, don't, don't over leverage just because it's available to you. Uh, go for the longer amortization. Okay. Like, but you know, the thing is, if you're, as I, I call it Fred's bank, Fred's bank is the alternative to the, the Fannie Mae. And so Fannie Mae will give you a 30% uh, a 30% am, a 30 year am, 80% uh, LTV, but Fred's bank will give you 25% down, uh, maybe tw maybe 30% uh, uh, down and uh, a uh, 20 year am or 25 year am. So they're much more uh, restrictive, they're much more conservative. Um, and you know, so I don't net, granted it, it's, you, you're reducing your cash flow by paying more to the bank, but you're paying down your mortgage faster and you'll just realize it on the end, on the end when you go to sell a property. So, you know, uh, I look at, I look at shorter amortization period as being a little more, more conservative, which I, I tend to be after the last uh, crap. I agree with that. I, I would not say that the amortization is the, is the biggest value add, right? So the biggest value add between Fred and Fannie it first is recourse. Uh, second is term, right? If you're a long-term holder yeah. with, with, with Fannie, with Fannie Small, you can do a 30-year fixed and fully amortizing loan like you would get on your house with a 10-year prepay. Um, if you're, if you're a long-term holder, that's a beautiful thing that, you know, this goes back to cycles, but interest rates may or may not go down or stay static in perpetuity, but may or may not, there's, there's a much higher likelihood that they go up than down over time, just because of how much room exists on, on either side, perhaps. Yeah. Um, but when you're, okay. Take your time. Warren, <laughs> Take your time. Warren, Warren Buffett, Howard Marks, um, brilliant hedge fund managers, investors, um, the most successful that have transcended generations, their first mandate is not make a lot of money. The first mandate is to reduce risk and preserve capital. And as a multifamily investor, uh, the way you do this is, uh, is hedging future interest rate risk with longer terms. Uh, it's uh, hedging volatility with either ca some combination of cash flow or leverage, uh, managing it well. It's uh, reducing recourse and personal liability uh, via non-recourse loans, uh, special purpose entities, SPEs or SAEs, single asset entities, whatever you want to call it. So, so you, you make, you find a good investment. You really, really believe in it. It's a great deal. And, and, and then you start hedging. 
you're doing inspections, you're doing appraisals, you're managing leverage, you're managing cash flow, you're managing recourse, uh, you're, you're managing for worst case scenarios. You, you invest for, 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 for the bright future that lies ahead and you plan for um, the end of time. Yeah, the disasters that, that yeah. are never are always going to show. Um, yeah. But man, I, I could not agree with you more uh, about the discussion about term. Uh, if you know, if you have an option, take the ten-year term. Um, and and if you are looking to assume an existing mortgage, if you're going to go that route, if you assume an existing mor mortgage with less than five years on it, you are a fool. Listen, his name is Blake Jenner. Blake, how can we get a hold of you? Uh, give us the information, and we'll put it down in the show notes. Uh, but I, I'm looking forward to working with you in the future, man. I, I... Uh, so before I give you that information, I just want to say that I've been interviewed on a dozen uh, podcasts, and this was the most fun that I had whilst uh, – delving deeper into uh, topics that, that I normally do. It was enormously efficient. We got to touch on so many cool things. This was the best podcast uh, I, I'd ever been on. And, um, and, I, and I, I hope you'll have me again because oh, uh, this was really cool. Okay. This is, I so appreciate that. I have so much fun talking to people on these podcasts. I, I appreciate that. I have had a blast with you. You're a great guest. You've been absolutely fantastic. How do we get a hold of you? Well, you could visit us online at janover.ventures, no .com or .net, but you can learn more about us on janover.ventures. Um, we do happen to have the most active uh, digital media company on the internet for anything that has to do with multifamily or commercial real estate finance. So if you're looking for more information on multifamily loans, you can go to www, with or without the www, uh, multifam dot multifamily dot loans. So we're at multifamily.loans, commercial real estate dot loans, HUD dot loans and Janover dot ventures. Wow. Uh, you can tell your background has been in, in uh, you know, in the internet because those are cool web addresses. Those are very cool web addresses. Well, you know, you'll find that if you're on Google and you look up anything that has to do with multifamily financing, we're right there on the first page of Google. Um, and hey, if you'd like people, how do you do that? <laughs> and if, if you'd like to, uh, if you'd like to email me directly, you can email me at blake at janover.ventures. I can't guarantee you a very fast response time, but I can guarantee you um, a response or, or, or a referral to, to the right person uh, on the team. Uh, you can email the team at hello at multifamily.loans. Um, and you could call us. I think our phone number is 800-567-9631. Um, we do phone calls too. So, uh, His name is Blake Janover. Janover.ventures, not .com, .ventures, not .com. So, Blake, you've been a great guest. It's so fun to have you here. Uh, thank you so much for being on the Multifamily Podcast. Thank you, Charles. Thank you.